Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to pick up kind of where we left off last week. If you weren't here last week, we talked about uh, a little bit about the, uh, the fact that uh, many people live in states. You know, you all live in Louisiana. Uh, at least I presume all of you live in Louisiana, unless you're a guest and you're from out of state. Uh, one person said, you know, they were born in one state, they moved to Texas, and they said as soon as they could, they moved. Uh, and, and, you know, just uh, uh, we have some people that have come from all kind of different states. We have some people from Arkansas. Praise the Lord. Say amen, Miss Linda. Uh, and, and other people from, from different states. But uh, there is a spiritual state that I believe that all of us need to endeavor to get to. Uh, recognize that you can live in a, a, a geographical state, but you can also live in some emotional states. Uh, the emotional state of confusion. Uh, the emotional state of anxiety. You can live in the emotional state of depression, uh, despair, hopelessness, loneliness. You can live in the state of bitterness. And it's sad to say that even after a person gets born again and, and is, is a child of God, they can still find themselves in those emotional states that are not what God intended for us to live in. And that if you find yourself in any of those states, then it's uh, to borrow a term from a, a commercial, you got to move to a better state. <laughs> Amen. You got to move to the state of grace. So we shared a little bit last week that the state of grace is a spiritual state. It's a state that can only be determined, can only be located, can only be entered into uh, through the kingdom of heaven. And the word says in John chapter 3, Jesus uh, talking to uh, uh, Nicodemus, he said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so in order for us to get into the state of grace, we need to have made Jesus the Lord of our life. We need to have become born again so that we can enter into that state of grace. Uh, but recognize that it is, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, therefore we have a high priest verse 14 he says seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we were yet without sin therefore let us Come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And so when we talk about the throne of grace, we're talking about the seat of authority. We're talking about a place of authority. And so it is a, it is a spiritual place that we can enter into. And I believe that as we as the believers can uh, recognize uh, that grace is a place. Grace is not just an endowment. Grace is not just an unmerited favor. You know, we covered that a little bit last week. That grace is unmerited favor. We've heard that definition perhaps for years and, and recognize what does that mean. It simply means I, don't, I get what I don't deserve and I don't get what I do deserve. And I like to think of it this way. What I do deserve, the difference between what I do deserve and what I receive is grace. In other words, my life might indicate that I should get this level of reward, but God is going to give me this level of reward. The difference between the two is grace. In other words, I can't, I can't earn it. I, can't, I, I can only choose grace. To receive it. And so that's, that's, that's his grace. And so we looked at the fact that grace is kind of one of those things as a state of grace. It's, it's one of those things that we can't earn. There's nothing that we can't be good enough to get God's grace. But we can't be bad enough that we don't, we can't receive God's grace. So I was thinking about this a little bit. You know, if we live in the state of confusion, then uh, we're going to always be confused. 
Uh, and so we need to move to the state of grace. If we live in the state of despair, and you, you know people, they're just living in a state of loneliness, living in a state of bitterness, living in a state of constant rejection. And every time they, they meet someone, there's always these walls going up because they're afraid of being rejected. We live in a state, we live in a country, we live in a world that, has, that is being racked by terror and terrorists. Uh, and so it is causing a state of panic. It's causing a state of fear to rise up in individuals' lives. And so we recognize that the word says that we can go in through, we get into grace by faith. By faith we get into grace. But if grace if faith is the doorway into the state of grace, then humility is the key uh, that opens up that door. Because the word said God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And I was thinking about this just a little bit, thinking about states and uh, the state of, of grace. And we recognize that every state in the union has some... Uh, um, attractions, some points of interest, something that they try to capitalize on to get people to go visit their state. It's called tourism. Uh, for example, the state of Florida. The state of Florida has natural beaches that are just, they're beautiful, white, sandy beaches. It is a natural attraction, and those who are beach people, like Miss Kelly, uh, like to go to the beach, and they like the sand. They enjoy that. It's a natural attraction. Some people are not necessarily beach people, so they have, they have, they've, des they've designed man-made attractions like Disney. Disney World. And so if you like the roller coasters and the rides and all of that, then, then that's the place you go. There are those things that are attractions. You know, some states boast their islands like Hawaii or like Louisiana. You can go on the, the Cajun Riviera and go to Pecan Island and go to Cow Island or, or you could choose to go to Moss, uh, 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 Marsh Island. I believe there, there, there's a push in the state legislature to change the name to Mosquito Island. But, but that, you know, we're not going to go there. Uh, yeah, I, this is you know, kind of silly. But, you know, in the state of grace, there are some attractions. There are some points of interest in the state of grace. That, that draw us in, not, not to be tourists, not to be visitors, not just to spend our money there, but rather to reside there. Rather to come in and, and be part of it and to take part of it and to let that state of grace uh, not only live in us, but us to live in it. So one of the, the, the attractions, if you would, I call this the grace bundle. You know, some you go to an insurance place and, or you go to Cox or some place and they'll tell you, you can bundle this feature and that feature and that feature. You can get them separate, but you get a better deal if you bundle them. Well, I call this God's grace bundle. Now, you can separate them simply by study or simply by investigation. You study them perhaps individually, but when you see them, they're all interconnected. Uh, they're all uh, interlaced one with another. It's all part of the state of grace. I believe the first part of that bundle is what I call redemption. And the word calls it redemption in uh, uh, Psalm 130, verse 7. The word says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now when we think of redemption, we think and we look at the definition of redemption, it means to purchase back, to buy back, to ransom in full. A number of years ago, I read a story about a little boy and his grandpa who made a little sailboat. 
And this little, this grandpa and this little boy would go to the lake almost every afternoon or specifically on weekends. And they would, they would tie, his grandpa would tie a little string to the uh, front end of the boat. And they'd let the boat go out on the lake. And the wind would blow it here. The wind would blow it there. And it was just a real time of connection between the grandpa and the little boy. And then one day, you know, and they'd always bring the little boat in because it was tied with the string. One day the grandpa was not feeling well, but the little boy decided he wanted to go sail his little boat. So he went out to the lake with his little boat and, and, and somehow the, the string had gotten untied and he decided he was going to tie the string on it. And he, tie, he didn't know how his grandpa tied the string. Tied the little boat to the string and, and, and he tied it and he let it go and suddenly a burst of wind came and the boat untied from the string. And he tried to wade into the water but it got so deep that he couldn't, didn't know how to swim real well and so he lost the boat. And he was just broken hearted. His little boat had all the pretty colors on it, was nicely painted, had a little sail on it, actually had his and his grandpa's initials uh, 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 kind of engraved on both sides. And he was just broken hearted. He went back to the house and he said, Grandpa, Grandpa, I, I, I lost the boat. I lost the boat. And Grandpa just, you know, tried to console the little boy, but he was just so broken hearted. Weeks went by and every day he'd go look for the little boat. And, couldn't find the little boat and one day many years later he's walking through the downtown area of his community that he lives in and there's a store there it's one of those those flea market type things that uh, you people bring bring stuff that they're no longer using and so he looks in the window of this flea market and there is that little boat and he's just excited. He's so, just so excited about his, his little boat. And he went inside and he said, Mr. Mr. That, that is my, my boat. And he said, son, I, I, I'm sorry. Someone came in here and brought it in and that little boat is, is for sale. Well, how much? You know, it's not the little puppy in the window. How much is that little boat in the window? And he said, it's five dollars. And he said, okay, sir, hold it for me. I'll be back. And he ran home and talked to his grandpa. And then he said, well, his grandpa said, son, you, you'll, have to, you'll have to see if you have enough money to buy it back. So he went to his bank and he broke open his little piggy bank and he counted out his dimes and his, his quarters and his 50 cent pieces. And he had five dollars. And he ran back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the little a store and he brought that five dollars and he said sir I want my boat and he gave him the five dollars and he took his boat and he went home and he looked and there was the initials but you see the little boat had been weathered it had been beaten and the and, and the the sails were, were were torn and the the mast was was cracked and split and he went home and he began the process of restoring his boat and he loved that boat even more so because he began to say, you are twice mine. He said, I made you and I bought you back. You see, you and I are like that little boat. God made you. He created you. He, he breathed life into you. And that through series of events and through life, sometimes your sail gets broken. Sometimes your paint gets tarnished. Sometimes the outside gets broken. Sometimes the inside, your soul gets warped and gets, gets challenged and gets broken and beaten. And, and because of life and all of the issues that we're subject to. But God says, I took the blood of my son Jesus and I bought you back. But not am I, I'm not going to leave you like you are. I'm going to make you over again. And I'm going to recover those things I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna heal those broken masks and those torn sails and that hurt soul I'm going to heal and I'm going to cover and I'm going to take care of you because you are precious you're twice mine 
Boy, I tell you, when I think about that, just realize how much God paid for you and I. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 says this, and this is a little longer passage, but I want to read it, and we're going to break it into, into pieces. It says, but now... The righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Now watch this. Now, after the cross... After the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, he said the righteousness of God appeared apart from the law. Up until Jesus came, the righteousness that was available was the righteousness of the law. If you followed all of the law, if you followed all of the precepts of the law, if you followed all of the sacrificial system, then you would be considered righteousness. Righteousness was accounted to you because of faith. But in this case, because now Jesus has come, thank God we don't have to follow follow all of the sacrificial system. We don't have to follow any of that. We simply say God's righteousness has been, uh, has been revealed, and it is to all, not just the white folks, not just the black folks, not just the Hispanic folks, not just the Asian folks, not just the American folks, not just the church folks, but for all. But it says, and all who Believe. You see, it's available to all, but it's only those who believe actually receive. Now, watch this. Keep on. Ver verse 23. And you know, sometimes we use, we start right here with the Roman road to salvation. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the God, uh, shall fall short of the glory, shall fall short of the glory of God. You know, just brains going faster than the tongue. Verse 24, being justified freely by grace through what? Through the redemption. Being justified. In other words, being just, being righteous by his grace. Freely by his grace. In other words, he's saying this, that your sins are not accounted unto you because the purchase price of you included the purchase uh, to cover and to deal with your, your sin, your past. Uh, the things that you did in your past have been washed, have been cleaned. And the redemption means that uh, doesn't matter what's happened in the past. Jesus has purchased you. And freely... That justification is yours. Now, go on, verse 25. When God set forth as a propitiation, that's the satisfaction by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in him. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, we've, we've, we've endeavored to answer the question, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, repentance or forgiveness? Well, I'm going to answer the question. But, you know, we think about that. Some say, well, you know, unless you repent, God won't forgive you. Well, when we look at this verse of Scripture, the Word says God is going to pass over the sins previously committed so that he would be just, not just for one, not just for two, 
not just because your good looks, your charm, your personality, not because of your education, not because of your religious background, but he's going to be just to all, and he's the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Now watch this. The word says in the book of Romans that it is his goodness that leads us to repentance. So the answer to the question is, it is his forgiveness that comes first. And when we recognize that God looks over my transgressions, looks over my sins, looks over those. Because in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 25, he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. And he says, and I will not remember your sins ever. So what happens is he washes over and he looks over your sins. Why? Because of the redemption of the blood of Jesus has paid the price for your sin, has paid the price for your transgressions, and he says, so forgiveness is available and all I have to do to accept that forgiveness is accept what Jesus did on the cross. And that, become, that means I believe it, I receive it, and forgiveness then becomes mine. And then when it becomes mine, see, we think of repentance. We think of someone, you know, we think, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Oh, God, I'm, I just can't believe I did such a stupid thing. God, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, that could be part of it. But that is more confession than it is repentance. You see, somebody can come up and be, oh, so sorry, because they got caught. <laughs> they're, they're sorry and they're remorseful because of their acts and the things that they did. But if they don't make a change of heart and a change of mind and a change of direction, they've, done, they've confessed, but they haven't really made a change. And, and, and repentance, see the word repentance means to change your thinking and change your direction. And so we recognize then that forgiveness comes, first of all, by a gift and a grace and the grace of God that he's purchased us. But then when I recognize it and I see the cost of that redemption, the, the word says in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1, that we weren't redeemed by, by natural things or corruptible things like silver or gold. You know, I wouldn't mind having a couple of pounds of gold. But that's tarnishable, he said, and that's, that's, that's corruptible. He said, you were purchased with something that was not corruptible. Incorruptible. The blood of Jesus. Now you see, the value of something is determined by how much somebody is willing to pay for it. Have you ever watched uh, channel, I think it's channel 61, it's the NBC Sports Network. I, turn on there every once in a while, and a lot of times late in the evenings, they have these automobile auctions. And I mean, these are some cars to drool over. 1966 Pontiac GTO with the hood scoop and the 427 motor and the four barrel carburetor. Cherry color, beautiful car, selling for $165,000. It only sold for $5,000 when it was thinking brand new in 1966. Now it's $160,000 more. Why? Because somebody's willing to pay it. <laughs> and look at, look at me. Look at us. It, I don't know what it cost to, for, for me to be born. 1952, huh? $56. $56. Glory to God. I knew she'd remember. So for $56, this is what she got. 
21 years later, the Lord Jesus Christ, well, actually 2,000 years ago, shed his blood that's priceless for me, for you, to redeem you. Now, let me ask you this. So, we're redeemed, and we understand that, but what was redeemed? The Word says, He redeemed my soul in peace. You see, sometimes our, our, it's our soul, our, our mind, our will, and emotions that need, to be, that need to be transformed. He needs to redeem us. He's redeemed our spirit by that blood, but we recognize that our soul can be renewed. Our soul can be transformed, and he's renewed my soul. How many of us need peace? Realize he's already bought it. He's already paid it. Psalm 103, he says, he's redeemed my life from destruction. He's redeemed my life. And another translation calls it from the pit. How many of you, you, you find yourself in the pit and realize you've already been redeemed? Just get out of that stinking pit. But what has he redeemed us from? Psalm 107 says he's redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Now, the hand, when I think about that a little bit, when I think about the hand of the enemy, it's talking about his power, his control, his means, his direction. And so Satan has a plan for your life, but God says, enough is enough is enough. I have redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. You are no longer under the control of Satan, no longer under his control. He no longer has any right to tell you what to do and what to go, where to go. And, and the direction for your life, you've got to realize that when the enemy comes in to try to tell you that you are nothing, you are worthless, you are nobody, you are an insignificant little piece of flesh, mostly water, then, then, then you've got to realize, no, I am the bought, blood of, bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been redeemed, and I'm not going to follow in that footstep. You see, the enemy tries to come in and work in your mind. Tries to make you convinced that you will never amount to anything. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what the devil tells you. You are already somebody and something of immense value. Glory to God. Whew, let me get back to my notes here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, He will redeem us from the house of bondage. When I think of that, when he talks about the house of bondage, what he was talking about was the house of Pharaoh. Was talking about Egypt. Now, Egypt is not just a geographical area. Egypt was a, was a type and shadow of your, your old lifestyle. Was a type and shadow of the way you used to be. You see, aren't, isn't it interesting when you meet somebody that you haven't seen in 20 years? And, and they remember who you were. They remember the way you used to act. They remember your old attitudes. They remember how you used to be. And all of a sudden, they want you to be what you used to be. And that ain't me no more. I don't be like that anymore. I am not that person any longer. Why? Because I'm no longer that person. I'm a new creature in Christ. But now watch this. If you're not careful, you can revert back. If you're not careful. Now, now, now let me say it this way. If you don't stay full of the Word, full of the Holy Ghost. Now that's in the spirit realm. If you don't get the proper rest, the proper diet, the proper exercise, the stresses of life will pressure you and you'll find yourself acting and talking and doing just like you used to do. No matter how much word you spend in. And so it's a, it's a matter of balance, not just spiritual, but natural. 
And so if I got to realize that uh, as long as I'm in the spirit, as long as I'm rested, as long as I am I, I, I'm, I'm in, in, in sync with the spirit of God, then, then, then the stresses of life and the pressures of the world don't affect me much. But when I let myself slip, I fall right back in to that house of bondage. Amen. And so, uh, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. These are all verses of Scripture. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And we could, those are all messages all in itself. We're not going to go into that right now. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. And so redemption comes right alongside forgiveness. Comes right alongside of that, that forgiveness that we talked about just a minute ago. And it's according to the riches of His grace. The Word says that He is rich in mercy and rich in grace. And so we got to realize that this, this, next, this next feature is the fact that God has forgiven us. God is not holding our sins against us. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Psalm 32 verse 1 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. A person might say, well, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't stolen anything. I've been honest in all my business dealings. I don't have to be forgiven. Now, a person could say that if they do not understand biblical forgiveness. If they do not understand a spiritual concept of forgiveness. You see, I, I, I could live all my life and be honorable and may not necessarily need to be forgiven from someone else. But because I was born into the human race and because I was born into the first Adam then my need for forgiveness may not be from another human being. But my need for forgiveness comes, is from God. And so he says that, that blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Uh, and we, we covered Isaiah 43. He blots out our transgressions for his sake. And he said, and I will not remember your sins. Isn't it interesting? Mark chapter 9. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 9. Mark chapter 2. And Luke chapter 5. Gives us an account of four men. Who carry a paralytic man on a. They call it a pallet. Probably more, more like what we would consider a stretcher. They carried him to Jesus. The word says in Luke chapter 5 that he was ministering there and there were uh, teachers of the law that were there. It's Luke chapter 5. And he says, and the power of God was present to heal them. The challenge was that none of them believed it. None of them received it. They were the righteous folk. They were the folks who did not need forgiveness. They were the folks who said, I have followed the law. I have followed the precepts of the Old Testament. I don't need forgiveness. But here was a man who was lowered down through the tiles. And notice what Jesus said. The first thing he said to him. Yo, man. Yo's added. It's not. It's not. Added. <laughs> Your sins are forgiven you. Notice he didn't say, what do you want me to do for you? 
He didn't ask, do you want to be healed? He didn't ask, man, what's your trakash, eh? <laughs> that means, what's your trouble? He didn't, he didn't ask him any of that. He made a bold statement that was pre-cross, and yet at the same time, God's directive to the man. And he said, your sins are forgiven you. Now watch this. Too often in our life and too often in the life of even believers, there's something going on in their life, something going on in their body, something going on in their mind, something going on, and, it's, and they, 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 they've got this thing. It's attached to this, this failure that I had 20 years ago. It's attached to that sin that I did. I've repented. I've asked God's forgiveness and all that, but it's still there. There, and it's still the enemy comes in and boggles our mind and says, yeah, but you did that 20 years ago. You know, you stole that $5. And, and in my case, you went into the neighbor's refrigerator and was eating some of the, ca some of the cake out of the refrigerator. <laughs> Ask mama, she'll tell you. <laughs> I did that. I'm not proud of it. I was about six or seven years old. But you see, some of those things stay with us. Your mind is better than any computer ever developed because it'll remember the challenges. It'll always remember the bad stuff. And this man is laying on this, this pallet. And we don't know what sin he committed. We don't know what, what was causing his paralysis. We don't know. But Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Can I tell you this morning, it doesn't matter what kind of pallet you're laying on. It might be a spiritual pallet, a, 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 a solic pallet. You may be bombarded and paralyzed in your thinking, paralyzed in your life. I want to tell you this morning, you are forgiven. And so the people of the law said, huh, this man blasphemes. He's, who can forgive but God himself? And so Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, he said, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or rise up and walk? Well, now, in, in actuality, each of them were pretty easy to say. But see, Jesus realized a man would not rise up and walk unless he received the forgiveness. And so he said, to show you that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins, rise up, pick up your pallet, and go home. The man didn't look at him and say, man, I can't. <laughs> he got up, picked up his pallet. And he went home. Another occasion he told a man, now I don't know, he didn't tell this particular one that. Another occasion he told a man, he said, now don't go, now he said, don't sin anymore. Because something worse will come on you. You see, you got to realize that forgiveness is, is a key to many times the issues going on in our life. Forgiveness, us having to forgive others, but of our having, ourselves having to receive forgiveness. Now watch this. If he's, uh, Titus chapter 2, there's another connection. Uh, you, you remember we talked about the bundle. The first part of the bundle is redemption. The second part of the bundle is forgiveness. The third part of the bundle is, is this word that, that Christianity has used that, that sometimes has become a little bit cloudy. Is this word called Salvation. Because the first time, first time, you know, we talked to someone and just yesterday uh, had an opportunity to, uh, uh, the honor of uh, doing a memorial service uh, for a, a man of about 75, 76 years old. Um, he was one of our singers on Saturday night, Mr. Lee Hawkins. He, some of you may, may remember him. Um, he didn't come very often on Sunday morning. But I had the, the opportunity to do a memorial service. 
And the thing about Mr. Lee was that he had given his heart to Jesus many, many, many years ago. And so when someone talks about salvation, they're, they're, they're asking, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? And the Bible tells us in Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Sometimes coupled with that, when we hear of someone who's passed on and we don't know them, very often we'll ask, were they saved? Had they made Jesus the Lord of their life? And, and you know, that's, th that is a good question to ask. It's okay to ask that. The challenge is that if we have a limited mindset and think that salvation and being saved only means we go to heaven when we die, then we are limiting God's working in our life. It's, it's kind of like, and we've, I use this illustration some, it's kind of like walking into Walmart and say, Mac, you all look at all this stuff. But never taking a basket and never going and putting it any in your basket. And you got to pay for it before you take it home. You, you understand. Some people try to take it home without paying for it and they wind up in jail. But, but you know, it, it, you, you, you make it yours. You say, wow, look at all this stuff. You see, someone could make Jesus the Lord of their life. Someone could walk into, in, into salvation, walk in by coming up to a, to a front of a church or, or, or being led in a, in a sinner's prayer. And in every memorial service that I do, I give people an opportunity to say the sinner's prayer. Depending upon the group that I'm with, it will depend upon how I term that prayer. The one prayer that was probably more, more participated in was done about 20 years ago. I had an opportunity to do a memorial service for a teenager from Como High School who committed suicide. Parents were part of our church. They were only here for a month. And they asked me to do the memorial service. So I went and I did it. And this place was packed with over 300 teenagers. And we said, we shared that small prayer. And I asked them, how many of you, this is the first time you've ever prayed that prayer? And about 80 to 90% of the people raised their hand. They never heard anything like that. And so all that is, is what I'm saying is it's all part of the state of grace. But at the same time, we have to realize that word in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For you have been, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourself, that is, it is a, the gift of God. That word salvation in 2 Titus means deliverance, preservation from danger. The word saved in Ephesians means to be safe, to be delivered, to be protected, to be healed. And I like the last part of that definition. It says, to make whole. You remember in Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 5, the little lady with the issue of blood. And she went to Jesus, she went in, the, the word says she went in, she had been to doctors for 12 years and she never, she wasn't getting any better. She had spent all of her life savings, all of her husband's inheritance, she had spent everything she had on trying to get well because she had an issue of blood. But she got only worse. She went into the crowd and she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I, I'll be made well. And she went in, she touched the hem of his garment. You know the story, you can read it in Matthew, Mark chapter 5. She touched the hem of his garment and Jesus stopped. And he said, who touched me? 
He said, I felt virtue leaving me. I said, I felt power leaving me. I felt dynamis leaving me. Who touched me? And she caught and she said, me. She explained the whole story. And he looked at her. And he said, woman, your faith. And you know the, you know the verse. says, your faith has made you well. Or made you whole. You see, that was the way they translated it. But it's the same word in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved. Through faith. So, so you, you might say it this way. As he looked at her, he could have said, Woman, your faith has saved you. So my question for you this morning, what issues do you have in your life? You see, we know her issue was an issue of blood. But you see, every one of us has got issues. And that issue, regardless of what it is, Jesus wants you to tap in to the anointing. You see, it's that grace that gives us the capacity it's going into that state of grace where we can be made whole. And you know, you might look at a person and look at an individual and think, well, you know, they just look really good. You know, they've, they, they, they look slim, they look trim, they, they, they look fit, or, or, or they, <clears throat> perhaps they are a little bit larger and they, they look robust and they, and they look healthy and they got rosy cheeks and they look fine and they may be fine on the outside, but there's some stuff going on on the inside that we can't see. And God says, I want to take that issue you and make you whole because you see we may not be able to see everything that's going on in their spirit or in their soul or in their mind but in any case Jesus said if you press in to my state of grace if you steady press in and the word says come boldly to the throne of grace that you receive mercy and receive grace to help in the time of need. It's interesting in Matthew, cha Mark chapter 6 verse 56. After this lady did this and we don't know which came first. But I assume because one came before and one came early in, in Mark's gospel chapter 5. And, another got, and the other one is Mark chapter 6. They said that when he came to a city there were multitudes that came and tried just to touch his garment. And they said as many as touched him were, the word is sadzo, made whole. Thank you, Father. What do you need? What area of your life needs to be made whole this morning? Where, where do you need to be whole this morning? And so the state of grace has its attractions, has its, has its points of interest, has its things that bring us in. One, the fact that we have been bought with a price. Two, our sins, our transgressions are forgiven. His grace is sufficient. And three... He wants to make you whole this morning. Would you stand with me, please?